wrestling fans, if you're going to the NCAA tournament in Detroit, Michigan, Detroit Rock City, this Thursday, I'm hosting a happy hour at Hockey Town Cafe from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time with Stalemates. So we're co-hosting this happy hour. It's in between session one and two on Thursday at Hockey Town Cafe. Be there or be square. Now let's get to the interview with Spencer Lee. So what they say is Iowa style is your style. So whoever you are, like whether it's Spencer Lee or Jacob Warner, Iowa style is how you wrestle. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's it's five percent of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. Tuesday, March 15th, coming to you from Chicago IL, our last day in the land of Lincoln before we head out to Detroit for the NCAA tournament. In today's episode is with the great Spencer Lee. This interview was recorded in Carver Hawkeye the day after Iowa lost to Penn State. And this interview was recorded for the Hawkeye Wrestling Club Inner Circle. So the full video episode can be found at the Hawkeye Wrestling Club Inner Circle Portal, the audio podcast, obviously right here. So we hope you enjoy this one with the great Spencer Lee. Fan of the week goes to everyone who listens to this podcast on Spotify and has given us a star rating. We currently have 113 five-star reviews, trying to get to 200. Let's keep it going. So if you're listening on Spotify, please give us a star rating. Last but not least, folks, this episode is brought to you by Quant Wrestling. Quant is the money ball approach to predicting college wrestling results. They track in time hundreds of stats throughout a match so that you can predict match outcomes. Go to Quant Wrestling, available now in the Apple in Google Play stores, use the discount code WCML to get your first month free. Download the Quant Wrestling app now. Use the discount code WCML to get your first month free. Now, without further ado, let's give it up for Spencer Lee. Let's start with, uh, first of all, Spencer, welcome to the podcast. No, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. My... Let's start with a quote your dad used to say to you guys all the time when you were hitting the road. If... The only thing you walk away from this is the medals and trophies. He's failed. Is that something that was around a lot when you were going to tournaments, and how did that come about? Yeah, well, my dad always told me that the one thing he cared more about than winning wrestling matches was the people's perception of me and who I was as a person. So when I would go out, and he's, he'd always say, animal on the mat, you know, friendly off the mat. So I'd always be messing around or joking and smiling and playing on my DS or my Game Boy with a bunch of people, and then he'd be like, Spencer, you're up in two or three, and boom, it's like... You know, wrestling mode, and yeah. I'd run on the mat. He'd warm me up, boom, go out there. I'd be all mean. You know, I used to be like, I used to try to like stare people down. I don't know, because you always watch these wrestlers in college or in the Olympics, and they're always like staring people down. So I was always trying to be like that. It was always funny. I always had these modes where I was either the guy that was like really nervous or I was staring people down. It's just like when you're younger, you're immature. It just makes you laugh a little bit. So now, obviously, I'm way different. I just you have folks on yourself. I'm sitting down before a match. Just, but yeah, no, that that was his main his main goal was always. Be nice to everyone. Uh, look people in the eyes. Shake their hands. Make sure you go up to people. You know, I always, my dad always got compliments from, from uh, you know, grown adults from me because I would go up, shake their hand. How you doing? I'm Spencer. You know, I'd be looking straight in the eye and they're like, oh, you know, just, that's just how he raised me. So that was his goal and that that's what he cared about most even to this day. You know, make sure you sound cordial in interviews and you're not being an idiot or doing things that could 
hurt the perception of the program that you're in or, or who you are as a person as well. So. so it was about the character as much as it was the wins and losses? I was always, I was always about character and, and how, how people just perceived you. You know, he wanted people to be like, you know what, you know, he's a Hawkeye fan, but I'm still a fan of him. You know, that kind of thing. That, that was like, when I, when I hear that, that's probably what my dad's goal was, you know. He wants to make it's right. He wants people to be a fan of wrestling, not 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 just like the you know Hawkeye on you, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and obviously, when you look at some of the people you've been around, Shinshiro Abe, Eric Burnett, you know those guys are high integrity guys. But obviously, the man who uh, helped craft you, Jody Strip Matter, and, and John, talk about how you got involved with that program. It's actually kind of funny. I was at uh, the Virginia Duels, I think. I was on Team Pennsylvania, Young Guns brought a team there. And um, I remember I, was, I, I won like 12 or 13 to 0, and I was mad. I came off the mat, and I was fuming. Like I was like, I was like running off the mat trying to like leave, and, I, and you know, I have to, I'm always shaking the coach's hand. I will never like not do that. Um, in college, you don't do that, but that's actually rude probably to go shake the coach's hand, I think. But I, I, seriously, but in high, you know, high school, junior high, it's rude not to. I remember running over there to shake his hand, I'm like, smacked his hand trying to walk away and Jody grabbed my hand and pulled me in and said hey listen that was one of our best guys like what are you mad about I was like I didn't tech or pin him you know and and Jody looked at me like what like and my dad walked around I'm so sorry he's just you know he gets a little hot-headed if things maybe don't go his way like this he's 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 got you know pretty competitive he wants to always do better and, and Jody goes oh he's like he's like I like that you know he's like well why don't you come up to Young Guns and sometime and train you know and, and uh next thing you know it my dad's calling to be on like a Young Guns team, and he's like, "No, you can't be on the team over the guy that's already been in my club for a while. You know, we're gonna take the guy who's in my club, not not you. I don't care if you're the better wrestler. You know, my dad's like, you know, this is a guy I want my my son to be coached by. And next thing you know, he's driving up to Pittsburgh, and we're at Young Guns, and you know, eleven to twelve years old, never went to another club after that. So, what do you think made it stick? I just, I mean, the partners for sure. I mean, Jody's an amazing coach. John, they're very passionate. They're always doing the research. They're always watching wrestling. They're always talking about wrestling. They're more worried about how your kid, you know, was raised and how he acts, kind of like what my dad's all about, your character. After every practice, he would give a speech on, like, why you should be like this, why you should be humble. Thank your parents for being here, you know. Everything was like, be thankful. And, you know, they're, they're you know, very religious people, and they're, that's kind of how they they came into that, and they're always talking about that. You know, they're not going to like obviously push their beliefs on you because that's, you know, they, they're, John's a teacher. He understands, you know, all the you know limits of that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. yeah, they they're always like, thank your parents. This is an awesome opportunity. We didn't have this growing up. You know, you should be thank all these clubs popping up. You should be you know partners. But yeah, I mean, gosh, my my that room my sophomore or freshman year of high school is kind of ridiculous. And uh, for some of the folks who are listening on the Hawkeye Wrestling Club Network who maybe aren't familiar with that club, name off some of the hammers you were scrapping. Oh, like like Jason Nolf, um, like Jimmy Gulabon, Nico Megalutis, Luke Pletcher, Sam Crevis, uh, Michael Kemmer, Josh Shields, Josh Maruka, Devin Brown. I mean, um, there's so many more. I mean, gosh, there, there, was, there, was, there was probably in that room at one time, there's probably like 35, like, or 40 Division One guys at wow. one time. And we were in this one mat room in Franklin Regional High School. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It was it was just killers. I used to get my butt kicked. I'd go with, like, Nolf, then I'd go with, like, Pletcher, then I'd go with, you know, and it was just it was awesome. You know, once you were in that routine of going and, and you know, you had kind of decided wrestling was your sport, the, the tournament that got you there, I couldn't decide, was it the one when you went to Ohio and – you have really never lost, but you got teched. Or when you went to Tulsa and you, your dad thought you might go like 0-2 and you got third. Like, what, what do you think what had a bigger moment on your life? Definitely Tulsa. Yeah. I don't remember the Ohio tournament all that well because I think I was six. Yeah, I happened. just saw your dad say it in an interview that you would woke up in the middle of the night and you're like, Dad, Dad, I know what I did wrong. And he's like, oh, yeah. he's like how does a six-year-old do that? Yeah. That's crazy. Well, I remember, uh, well, I think what happened actually was I just turned seven that day and I went to an Ohio tournament where you could be eight and under, right? And everyone, it was like, there's only an eight and under, and you, I think you'd be like nine or something with a good birthday. I think it was nine and under, you just turned seven. Yeah, I was, I was young, right? So there's no more six and under. Right. And my dad, I was like, asked my dad for my birthday to go to a wrestling tournament. So we went to a wrestling tournament there, and I ended up getting beat like three times or something. And I, like, I think my last match, the guy teched someone who just teched me or something, right? So my dad's like, I think we should just go home, Spence, you know? And I'm like, I got one more match. And I guess I went out there and I had like a barn burner with this kid. Mm-hmm. I, and I get, my dad's like my level raised. And he was like, 
you know, maybe he's got something in him, right? And then that night, I'm like waking, shaking, waking him up, like, hey, I was doing this wrong, doing this wrong, right? And my dad's like, go to bed. We'll talk about <laughs> it in the morning, you know? And I think he remember he said he rolled over and looked at my mom and said, there's going to be a lot of wrestling in our life. And yeah, I mean, with the Tulsa as well, uh, I'd never been to a tournament outside the state, like besides Ohio, like in the vicinity, right? And we went there, and uh, there's like a chance tournament that if you went zero and two in the bracket, they put you into a new bracket so you could get more matches, kind of make your money work, which is pretty good, pretty good production marketing. And uh, I ended up winning the first match, I like pinned a kid or something. My dad's calling my mom all, all upset that I won. He's like, "Oh, there's no chance to bracket now. Now if he loses next to you, he's done." And then I win again. And then in the semis, I'm wrestling a kid that took like second or third the year before here at Tulsa. And I ended up winning like five to three, like just a barn burner. I got a takedown at the end, like last 10 seconds to go up five to three to win. So I'm in the finals against, uh, I was actually in the finals against Austin Gomez. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, you want to laugh. The guy I beat was Mario Gillian, he wrestled for Ohio University. And then the guy in the finals was Gomez. And I went wrestling him and I went out and then, like I hit a shot guy's leg and he just smet mixed with me. Boom. Roll, hold me on my back whole period. Second period, same thing. I shot him, spent next to me, held my back the whole period. <laughs> and and then I think like the third period, I was like, same thing. It was just like, there wasn't much that went on after that. I think it beat me like 10 to, 10 to 1 or something. Yeah, but it was, it was just funny because I lost. I took third, but my dad was all happy because I made the finals. I wasn't really supposed to uh, uh, win any matches, but he said my level raised and I wrestled really well and he was pretty proud of me. So that was like, He's like, call my mom, like, I think he's going to be special. My mom's like, he's eight, Larry, like, <laughs> he's special, like, you know, and it just made me laugh a little bit thinking about all those times, you know. Well, it's cool because your parents aren't normal parents because they were high-level judo people, um, especially your mom uh, and your dad, right? Yeah, well, so my dad was a national judo coach at the Olympic Training Center for, I don't know how many years, and then he was the Paralympic judo coach as well um, until 2000, like 1992 to 2000. My mom was Olympic alternate in 1992. For, for France? For, for America. For America? No, not for France. I think that girl won the Olympics in 92. That girl would have been a pretty tough person to beat. Um, Got it. Uh, or maybe silver. Like Japan won. But no, my mom took uh, second. And the girl that beat her actually didn't make weight at the Olympics. So they didn't have anyone represent because they didn't bring her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's one of those times where it's like the alternate actually would have gone. Oh yeah. Yeah. I guess, well, the girl that beat her um, was winning international tournaments, like international ranking tournaments at like 120. And she beat my mom at 106 for the Olympic uh, team. She was just really big. Mm-hmm. Her rest of her career was in the 20s even, or even higher after that year. But uh, my dad was, like, begging the, the Team USA, like, hey, please bring my wife. Like, she, the girl's not going to make weight. Like, he's like, I know weight. My dad is the king of making weight. I mean, I made 110 at Junior Worlds when I weighed 130 naturally, right? And uh, that's just how he is. And I, you're going to make weight if you're around my dad and his schedule. My dad's like, hey, they're not, he's, she's not going to make weight. And they're like, it's your wife. You just want your wife to compete in the Olympics. He's like, no, this girl's not going to make weight. And then they call her coach and like, can she make weight? And the coach is like, yeah, she can make weight. And my dad's like, she's not going to make weight. And the girl goes out and misses weight by like whatever, two or three pounds, passes out, has to go in the hospital, put IVs in her kind of thing. And my dad's like, see, she didn't make weight. So that was like his biggest regret is because they're like, it's your wife. You only care about, you want your wife to compete. You know, you hope she doesn't make weight. He's like, no, I hope she does. She made the team. Congrats mm-hmm. to her. That kind of thing. So that's that, that kind. Of, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's hard because judo doesn't have a lot of funding. So okay. their reasoning was one, it's his wife, and two, funding. But then no one competed at the Olympics. It's like funding to send an alternate. That can't even be like that much. You know, like maybe a couple thousand. I know. Wow. Yeah, Crazy. they're that. They're that bad. I mean, USA Team USA is like the train center. They're funded by success. So the more success you have, the more money you get, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shout out, Bobby Telford. Yeah, for real. But I think um, just, because we all know wrestling is has some crazy parents, right? But when you have a dad like yours who's educated and like knows development and knows education, he's saying this to your mom, you know, there must have been something there. Once you got into middle school and you're in the swing of things and you're just, you're killing kids, when, like, what was your training regimen? Were you going to like a club practice, then Young Guns? Mm, so, I mean, pre high school. Yeah, so like junior high is, I mean, obviously junior high and high school is honestly kind of stinks because you're in a place for so long. Because uh, you, you work out in the morning, I'd run in the morning, then you're in school for six to seven hours, right? And then right after school, I'd you have your junior high practice. And then after my junior high practice, I would get out a little early, junior high practice, go to a car, and I'd drive young guns. 
I'd be eating, I'd be eating in the car. Uh, from Sagertown, it was it was about an hour forty five, I think. And so we would drive that. I'd be eating in the car, do my homework in the car, all that, you know, and then I'd go wrestle and then I'd sleep on the way home. Boom. And we went to Young Guns. It was, I think I think at Frank Regional Young Guns was Monday, Wednesday, Sunday. So we would go Monday, Wednesday, Sunday to Young Guns. And when you and the Pops ever roll around in the basement when you got home? No. No? No, he was never. Uh, the only thing we ever did is whenever I got hurt, we would do like judo stuff. He was teaching me like how to use my feet and judo when I had, like had shoulder surgery back in, when I was in high school, but no, he he probably honestly kicked my butt. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> both my parents probably could. <laughs> I heard your mom. I mean, she for a long time she could legit like take you down. You couldn't take her down, which is hard yeah, to believe. Yeah, well, her. well, it, it wasn't that I couldn't take her down. Is that she would choke me out if I did? Because chokes are legal in judo. Oh yeah. Really? Yeah, ch- judo is is uh, judo is you know, on your feet, throws, and, and you know, judo, judoka is like, means like, I think it means like a gentle way in, in Japanese, because it's like using their momentum against them. So mm-hmm. they, they, they walk into you, you throw them, right? So right. throws, and then when you get to the mat, if you don't get an epon, which is like laying on your back, then you could arm bar, choke, you use the gi, mm-hmm. choke. So my mom would always grab my shirt or my hoodie and she would choke me right here. <laughs> and she would choke me, you know, I used to get choked out all the time, but my mom was hilarious. I used, to, I used to get so mad, because I would start messing with her, and I would be grabbing. Next thing you know, it, she'd throw me or something in front of my friends, or or I would throw her. And next thing you know, it, she's legs in, choking me out or something. You know, and I, <laughs> you know, I used to laugh. Wow. So that's the uh, that was kind of the development you had. And then one of your my favorite tournaments I love to to read about from you is your second Junior Worlds. You alluded to it earlier when you made the the massive cut from 130 to 110. It was that in France. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it was in France. So talk about just kind of like. Just the, the challenges getting over there, because I understand there was like a flight delay, the weight cut was brutal, yeah. and then your finals match, we'll go into detail next, that was really, you know, you had to dig deep there, but just talk about that experience at Second Junior Worlds. Well, uh, usually you go to a, like the camp for the, the other world team members, right? But my dad basically told them that if I go to the camp, that I probably won't make weight. Um, so he's like, he needs to be like in a place where he's in a routine and he knows, you know, I, I can control everything, you know? And so we didn't go to the camp, and I was having obviously having a hard time making weight just because, man. A, I mean, I, I shrink, it took me six months to shrink my body, probably six months. Yeah. And throughout that time, they're not you're not having like cheat days on the weekends where you're eating whatever you want. It's pretty disciplined throughout that six months. Yeah, I mean the thing was I could I I mean I only I ate whatever he put in front of me, and I was allowed to drink as much water as I wanted. So all day you can just drink. As much as you want, no matter no matter how much water you want, you could drink. Just so if you ever felt hungry, is go drink a sip of water. And that might sound like a like a what like a body disorder, like <laughs> eating disorder, right? But that's just how it needed to be done to get my body weight down to mm-hmm. one. Because what happened is I was smaller. So the first time I made one ten, I was only weighing like in the twenties. And then like two or three months later, I kind of grew. Like I just and then like the next thing I know, I was weighing like 30, 31. and that was like big for me, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm 21 over. And my dad's like, oh, that's okay. We just got to get it down. And because there was like three months between each competition. It was like, it was like U.S. Nationals and then World Team Trials. And then there's like a th- or three months or four months between the team, World Team and Trials and then the, the world. Mm-hmm. So after three or four months, it was like hard to keep your weight down for that long. You know? so, so I did. It was hard. That was six months. That's a. I mean, that alone is a journey to get there. Oh yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was funny. It was. It was brutal. I. Uh, how, I how close were you as you got like as you're trying to land the plane and get it down there for weigh It's like how close were you like a couple of days out? So um, I was in Rio with Dennis. I was. I was his training partner there. So um, I think the lightest I got in Rio was like one twenty one, and um, that. So that ended. So we left Rio the 24th of August, and I competed September 2nd, I think. Okay. So I was like 121, 120. The lightest I ever got down to was 115. Um, that was a day of weigh And then I had to lose five and a half that day. And this is weigh-ins. day of or day before? This is day of, day before weigh Okay. It's a day before weigh Day of would have been... Uh... Day, of, day of, I would have been at the weight above. Right. Um, yeah, there's no point. Well, that, that's kind of why I did that weight cut. Mm-hmm. I was kind of proven to the world that it's stupid to have nine for weigh-ins. A guy like me who weighs 130 is going to go 110. I'm wrestling junior high kids, does that look like? 
They were so small, you know. I remember wrestling the semis. Actually, that kid just won U23 Worlds. Kashalov, Afghan Kashalov. The kid in the semis or the finals? Kid in the semis. Got it. Kid in the finals. Probably hasn't done anything. He's a weirdo wrestler. Um, Dude, he looked about 24, he's man. He's big, too. He, he had um, the beard. But so, mm-hmm. uh, so, and leading up to you just mentioned, you went to Rio with Dan Dennis, which I think is just the coolest thing. I did not know that until we spoke to Dan in October. Yeah. Was that a, I mean, it had to be a pretty eye-opening experience going to your first Olympics. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool seeing the Olympians train and get ready for the Olympics and, you know, watch them compete in the arena. Yeah. That was cool. And so you come back, you fly over to, where was it at this year or that year? Uh, France, Macron, France. France. That's right, yep. yeah. Cool. So you get there, you make the weight, and then, you know, Typical Spencer Lee style, roll through most of the tournament, and then the finals, you find yourself in an absolute barn burner. What happened in that match if, if you, as you look back on it? Uh, well, yeah, I really thought that I'm not like a guy, I never overlook an opponent, but I think I wrestled like maybe two and a half minutes in four matches leading up to the finals. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the guy, like I said, the guy that I had in the semis, he ended up winning U23 Worlds this year. So, and I tagged him in like the 45 seconds maybe. Got like two takedowns and three gut wrenches or something. But he was so small. Like, I mean, I was like, I was taller than him and I was thicker in every possible way. I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> Night per way is so stupid, you know. And so I go in the finals and I go, well, I don't even know who this kid is. Like, the Russian lost. I beat that Azerbaijan guy. I was like, I don't know any of the other guys. Like, I, I've never heard of any of them. A lot of the guys were kind of around the weight at the same time and stuff. Like, previous junior worlds that I won, there's three or four guys that had been in my weight classes at the Cadet World and stuff. And mm-hmm. Some of them won Cadet, Cadet Worlds at w- weights below me and stuff. So I actually recognized people's names and stuff, but not this guy. I had no idea who he was. He was from Kyrgyzstan. No clue. I didn't even know that, like, country had wrestling. To be honest. <laughs> it wasn't not to be, like, you know, misinformed or anything. But I remember, I remember like, he uh, he would tape his all his fingers individually, kind of like Sargush with Burroughs. And he's like, when you grab fingers, you couldn't pull your finger away. But... um. Because of Sargush and Burroughs, I think that when you tape all the individual fingers, if you say something to the ref, they'll make him take it off. So I remember watching the warm-up, he had all this tape on his fingers. And I'm like, I'm like, he's not keeping that on to wrestle me. That's stupid. Because the way the kid would wrestle is he'd grab elbows and he would throw them by. And we go on the mat and I look at his hands and they're gone. So I feel like he had like tape to make his fingers more grippy. Because I remember, you can even watch the match. You can, if you watch the first 10 seconds, I like club him and he grabs my elbow and I try and get my arm off and I remember I kind of like threw it off and I walked backwards and I was like, oh my gosh, he's so grippy. Mm. Like, yeah, he actually was able to hold my arm. It's like the residue from the team. Yeah, and and he would like squeeze real hard and it was really annoying. And I remember like I I, I got to an easy shot and I was running to the out of bounds. I went body lock because, you know, I I was used to overpowering these little guys, right? But he was taller than me. He was pretty big for 110. And I went to throw him down and he like reached into my, my crotch and like, I use my momentum and just, boom, next thing I'm on my back, you know, and I was like, you know, I fought off my back, and I'm down 4-0, and he would do this move afterwards, after the throw, where I would snap him, and he would just hold on to my arm, and then he would grab my, like, my leg, and then he would jump over me, he would, like, whip over, and uh, it's funny, because the points were kind of like, the refs didn't even know how to call this, because we're both hitting, like, our back, yeah, and it's like, I'm, who initiated that? Yeah, yeah. well, you know, because I would be circling around him, and when I'd circle around, he'd grab my leg like this, and then he would jump. And some of the times I would like kind of, I, I would rip, rip his hip, so it looked like I was doing the move. So a couple of times I got to, a couple of times he got to. But the next thing you know, I, I'm in a hole. I was down eight to three, but he had a four point move, right? And go, so the second period starts, it's eight to three. And so I have to score, you know, one more point than he has because criteria I would lose. Right. And I, I don't even. All I, and I remember the, like, this match was really, it's like memorable to me because I didn't sleep, get any sleep that night. I think, uh, How come? honestly, I think it's because of the weight cut. You make, you know, you lose all that weight and then you're eating, drinking, whatever you want. I feel like your body's just working and working to, you know, process all this food and water that you haven't really been drinking the last week. And, and obviously you're nervous and I was just like trying to chill and I, I didn't get any sleep. And so I basically had all nighter and it was there's nothing terrible. worse than like when you're trying to sleep and you know you got a tournament and you keep looking at your phone it's like it's 1 30 like now it's 2 30 like what are you gonna do how they were how, if you had to guess like how do you think you were up that night oh i it was like 5 30 and i got up at six like i if i had any sleep it was 30 minutes maybe and and i was just like oh this is gonna suck but like i felt fine during the day you know i killed everyone and then we had that break once the break happened i tried to take a nap good nap and I was like, oh, and I felt terrible in my warm up. I was like, oh my gosh, this is bad. But like, it's okay. I was like, whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. like I, I always, I thought I was just gonna roll the kid up. But then I get into this situation, and I, I was like, 
I, I, I don't even like, I remember like the feeling in the match because uh, it was one of the only match. I think it's, it might be one of like maybe two or three matches in my whole life where I was losing. I've always, when I lose matches, I was always winning and like get scored on at the end or something, you know. And I was losing them pretty significantly. I just remember being so tired. I was so tired. I had nothing left, but this guy was just as tired as me. He was like, I don't know how he was so tired, but he was <laughs> he was dying. I mean, maybe it was the pace. I mean, I was always I was on him a lot. Mm-hmm. And I just remember just taking all these really bad shots, and I was just like all of this stuff, and I ended up getting some takedowns. And I remember uh, I was like on his head, and he went to do his pass by, threw it by, yeah. and I got behind him, and yeah, it was that was a crazy match. And when you're that tired, are you uh, are you thinking, shit, I'm really tired? Or I don't remember you... anything. About, there was no thinking. It was just like my body was just moving. Like I just remember, like every time I look at the clock, and I would just keep doing. I would just then I would shoot my head would be down. I'm just like trying to desperately to score. But this kid was like honestly kind of stupid. I was so tired. Like I I like, I'm basically like falling at the guy, and, <laughs> and and he steps into me and grabs me. Like he was like he wanted to tie, he wanted to tie up. Like if he just like ran around, I don't think I would have won the match. Mm-hmm. You know. But he just every time I'd walk at him, he would grab me. You know, and he would just hold, and I was able to like snap and like get to my shots and stuff. I was able to like use like close that gap, you know. But he, it was just kind of made me laugh. Where does that one rank in terms of matches where you were pushed, you know, beyond comfort zones? I mean, that that's probably the worst match I've ever like been through, like tired wise, just because I was just like I was so delusional, and like my body was still like beat up from making weight, and I didn't sleep. Yeah. And you know, all day, it just you know, I had four matches prior. You know, adrenaline still does something to you. It was just like. It was just, it was just like a lot. It was like a lot, you know. When I first read about that that situation, I thought you had wrestled and then like fueled up and then gone to sleep for the second day. You're talking about the first day you, there was no sleep and there was only one day. It's a one day tournament. One yeah. day tournament. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, four Damn. matches, then finals at night. Jeez, yeah. I mean, you look at your celebration after that. You are, I mean, just beside yourself, excited and emotional. I mean, it was a, it was a huge win. Yeah, I don't usually like celebrating, but I don't, I don't even remember doing any of that stuff. I just, I was like crying. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> it was awesome, man, to watch because, uh, you know, like you said, rarely have you been pushed to that level. I think you had said before that you had maybe not even gone a full six minute match except for like maybe your cadet, your first cadet worlds in freestyle. Yeah. I mean, you had pretty when much I lost. Yeah, you're right. Right, yeah. right, right. But besides that, though, I mean, how many matches have you gone the full distance in freestyle? Before? I don't know if I ever did. Right. So it's like, man, that's a that's a fun one to watch. And um, getting back to that, was it hard to transition back to like PA high school wrestling? Yeah, well, it stunk because um, I, I got, like, really big after making weight. Like, my body just, like, even though I wasn't trying to eat or drink that much, just kind of, like, it just held on everything. You know, it was kind of like I ruined my, like, my body so bad that, like, it just wanted to hold on to everything. And I had to, so I was, I was wrestling 26, but I weighed, like, 29, 30, right? Mm. So I, my dad wanted me to go 120, but then I was like, I was like, I don't want, I was like, I can, I guess, you know, I just felt like a wuss because um, there was like guys that were better at 26 than at 20 that year. And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to run from anybody, you know, like I don't do that. Even just because I want to be a four time one feet or whatever, I didn't, I didn't care. So I didn't even survive for 120. You just went with so 26. I went 26, yeah. Basically no cutting, just wrestle. And... Uh, there was zero cutting weight. When we got the two pound allowance, I, I, I was like, oh my gosh, I literally weigh this much. Yeah. <laughs> so well, after a six month uh, suck down like that, I mean, that to me, that's like as much of a testament to winning it as it is, um, you know, was winning the world title, just making the weight and proving yourself you could do it. Because that's a commitment. Yeah, that was brutal. The, the Team USA told me that uh, I wasn't allowed to make 110 again. Really? No, I had to go. I was. They're like, we have to go up. We won't let you compete. <laughs> I mean, probably a smart move because, like, you know, now with the day you wins. And so, of the, uh, you know, of the the epic tales of Spencer Lee in high school and that amazing career you put together, the other story I have to hit on that uh, is story of legend. And Bo Bassett picked this up from you, hanging the n- medal on the door. He he said he got that from you. I don't know what the backdrop is for that, but. Uh, so I lost to Soriano when I was in eighth grade. In the high school division of Super 32, he took me down with like half a second on the clock, maybe. Okay. And it was pretty like, I don't know, he was like, his arms were around me like this on the edge. So it was a pretty, pretty tough call. I think they called it to but they gave it to him and I lost. And I was like so mad because you know, I was winning the whole match. I wrote him out, but he got two locked hands calls. He would do this thing where he'd stand up and then he dropped his knee and he'd, he'd like, hold your hands. I get called for locking hands. Now, if you do that, Get, you can get called on bottom. Oh, sports and like, right? yeah, yeah, sports and like. But it was hard because I would, I would let go of my hands and stand back up because he's so quick. He had really good, he's good to boom. And then you'd lock and he'd 
knee would go down, you know, and I'm like, so you're like constantly, and I got called twice. Twice? Yeah, he didn't, and I wrote him out. I remember thinking that I got one st locked hands and one escape. I thought he got out. I, I watched him. I, I never watched the match, but I watched it like maybe a couple years ago because mm -hmm. I was just, because I was trying to retell it to someone, I think, like my roommate mm -hmm. or something. And because I was like, I was like, I don't remember how the score was three to two. I was like, I know I took him down and then I got out. And I was like, I don't know. I, don't, I was like, I think he might have got out and I locked hands calls, but I looked up and he had two locked hands calls, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. You know, especially because I'm good at top. I'm not, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to lock my hands, you know. You hit him with that. Would you call that a dump that you hit on the elbow when you're. It's not really a fireman. I guess it's kind of a fireman's. Was, I think it was, it, was, it was definitely a fireman's. Like fireman's in that one. Yeah, okay. but it was like it might have been on the outside leg, so not inside. So I think it might have been a dump. But yeah. Yeah, we call that I call that a dump, and it's a fireman's. Got it. Okay. You hit that early, put the right on pretty good, and then like you said, there was a, a couple of scrambles where they were calling locked hands, and it didn't look, look like it, but maybe it was. Well, one of the times he called me for locked hands, I had his wrist. That's the one because you look back at your dad. You're I was like, like I, had a bar. I was like, I was like, I was like, I had a, a reinforced like bar, and they called me, and I was like, what? You know, that was just there's no review, and you're in high school. Right, I mean, right. gosh. And you're wrestling up. Yeah, I was in I was in eighth grade then. Yeah. He was number one in the country in, in high school, and I was in eighth grade. At 103 or whatever. 106. It was. 106. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that bracket is good. I think it went Serrano, me, then Pletcher, so for a second, third. Wow. Yeah, I think Nick Lee was in that bracket too. So there's a bunch of there's a bunch of I mean that's a good bracket. If you go back and look at it, there's a bunch of names. You're like, oh wow, that's a pretty good bracket. You know, yeah. a bunch of you know national finalists or all Americans in that bracket. But uh, yeah, I remember losing and uh, I was so mad because I was like, I want to wrestle him again. I was like, I don't I don't feel like I don't really feel like I lost. You know, I was like, his arms were barely around me. I was like, we were out of bounds in the high school you know, rules. You know, two locked hands calls. Like I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, we got I, I was like, I want to wrestle him again. I was like, I, for me, I'd rather just lose by like, you know, my own merit. You know, I hate when it's like all the controversy and stuff. I'd rather just be like, oh, you took me down. That's my bad. Shouldn't have got taken down. So I took the medal and I put it on my door. And every time I opened my door, it would clang. It like reminded me that like, I don't want to lose next time. <laughs> and so that's kind of like where that came from. So. And what happened next year? I, I yeah, I mean, I ended up winning, but it was, it was an overtime. It was a pretty good match. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we both, no takedowns. Uh, both got out. And then he like... I don't think he took a single shot in the entire match until overtime. I was I was like running. I was just I probably pushed him out of bounds thirty times. A lot, yeah. A lot. You know? And he it's like he was stalling. I, mean, I was really pushing a lot. I wasn't doing much either. A lot of pushing, a lot of hands. We were clubbing each other pretty hard. And then he he like I went to reach and he boom right on my leg. And I we got into a scramble and I ended up scoring. So got it. I mean, a tournament of that caliber with the brackets as deep as they are, for you guys to meet the finals two years in a row is pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, but I mean, we were definitely the, the best in our brackets those two years. I mean, I didn't give up a single point in eighth, when I was in my eighth grade bracket leading up to the finals. Wow. And no one scored a single point on me. Uh, they were all blanks. And then and I was in eighth grade. And then the next year, same thing. It was pretty much similar, I think. I don't think I had a close match. Man. When you do, I'm mean, just your top game's incredible. Is that something you, at a young age, said, I really feel good on top? Or was that just a PA style of dude, wrestling uh, all styles? That's probably my dad. Yeah. All we, we went to all, he would take me anywhere to learn top and bottom. He's like, when you get older, you're going to work 90% on your feet. So we might as well get good on top and bottom now. Because mm. when you get into high school, they're going to be only showing you neutral stuff. They're only going to be doing neutral. Like, no one's going to teach you top and bottom. You're pretty much going to have to know, already know what you know. Mm -hmm. So. I've just been doing the same stuff since I was, you can even look, if you look up film when I was nine years old, I'm doing the same tilts, same, same firemen, same, whatever, you know, I, I, I had similar moves that, I mean, obviously I've changed a lot. Right. I, I would hope so, but, um, <laughs> but definitely like similarities to things, so. Well, when you watch those matches, I've heard people say, man, his grip, grip must be incredible, and I'm sure it is. Like, but like when you were in high school and college, what was the, like the weightlifting regimen for you, if any? Um, I didn't really lift weights ever growing up. I, I, I climbed rope a lot. I had like a, I had like a fifty, I had like a fifty-two foot rope in my backyard, growing up, and I used to think it was fun to climb it. So I would just climb it all the time because I thought it was fun. It was like it wasn't even like work for me. So I had this huge rope. I would just climb all the time. I climbed it every day, and uh, I I always did body weight stuff, a lot of push ups and pull ups and stuff. But that was it. I never even even in now in college, I don't go in the weight room really ever. If I'm in there, they'll make fun of me. Oh, good to see you here, Spencer. You know. <laughs> you know? If you look at the, uh, I mean, the rope is awesome because if you look at like guys like Bajrang or any of those guys in Dagestan or Ossetia, when they're going up and down it, down and back three times without touching the bottom, no legs, like yeah. it's, I mean, all those guys are doing it. It's one of the simplest ways to work out. 
So when you were doing it, I mean, how many, if you had to guess, times a day would you, were you going up and down that thing? I mean, I, I climbed that 52 foot rope at least three times a day every day. And I was like 10 when I got it. It was like a birthday present, <laughs> you know? Nice, man. That is a, uh, so no, no, uh, no weights, a lot of body weight. And you said you ran in the mornings. That was kind of your regimen. Yeah, I would run in the mornings. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, obviously University of Iowa, you announced the April 2016 between a couple top schools, but just, you know, was that process looking back at it now kind of more stressful in a moment or like for someone that young? I think the best advice I got was from a college coach. I can't remember who it was. Um, man, I feel old now. <laughs> a little while ago. Um, I think he told me that if you're not interested, please tell me because I don't want to waste resources recruiting you if you're not interested. And I was like, actually, my been Manning from Nebraska. I was like, I was like, sorry, coach, I'm just not interested in Nebraska. And he's like, okay, thank you, and hung up. And that was like the first time I re rejected someone. And I hated that. That was like, I hate like being like mean or rude or whatever. And so that was like what kind of opened my mind to like, okay, I need to like make sure the coaches know like where I'm at with everything. So that was definitely like good for me. But yeah, I had a lot of calls um, the first day. Everyone was, hey, you should come visit, do this, whatever, you know. Really interested, you know, things like that. But I narrowed my list probably down in like three days mm -hmm. to, you know, three schools, and that was it. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk to anyone else after that. I didn't string anyone along. It was like, hey, I got, these are my three schools. I'm sorry. And that's the end of it. So, and I just went to visit those three schools a few times and then made a decision. So. And then once you moved out, the whole family moved out as well, right? Oh, uh, yeah. My dad moved here my senior year of high school. So he got, he got a job, so. And once you got here, you were still going through the rehab process, and you were doing a lot of like Hawkeye Wrestling Club workouts. So you're working out with like, like some like the Gilmans, the Corey Clarks, the Dardanes of the world. Was that your first year, or was that later when you were rehabbing? Um, I wasn't cleared for a while. I probably wasn't cleared till November to wrestle because I had surgery right after March. Okay. High school, and yeah, so I was wrestling with those guys. It was, the room was a lot of fun. There's like Boris, um, like Delgado was in our room for a while, and you got the Dardanes brothers and you know, Gilman and Clark and and those guys. I mean, it was pretty 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 good, pretty good room. It was, yeah. it was a lot of fun. And once you got on on campus, what was like your not, not your first impression of the brands because you had spent so much time with them, but once you got to stay here and work out with them, and you know, maybe like a month or semester, and what was a what was your reflection on that? Uh, I think it was more like balancing wrestling in school. That was that was like what I wasn't. It was different. It was way different than high school. High school was miserable. High school is a waste of time, to be honest, um, with how much time you're sitting in, in a classroom for seven, eight hours. At least in college, you pick your classes, pick the times, and 50, 50 minutes to an hour and 15, or most classes are only that long, and you get maybe two or three of those a day, rather than sitting in eight hours doing nothing, basically. So that was nice because... I was able to go to class, still work out, take a nap, get ready for practice mentally. And then at night you can chill or hang out with friends or play video games or read, do your homework. So that was nice. So, in, in the, On the mat transition, pretty much what you thought? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got a taste of that, like training with Dennis and Rio and talking to them, like coming to the camp, in the clubs. I was just in the summers with all my things like that. So I got to watch a lot of practices visits and stuff so I, I kind of knew what to expect but it was definitely I mean, different than the partners were obviously a lot tougher than when I was in high school right and, and as you get here the, the team nucleus starts to build DeSanto comes in and then in you know last March you guys win the team title which sh you know should have won in 2020 quote unquote should have and then last year you guys finally get the W for the team title and that's something that I know has been a really important thing for you um, you know and as you look back in high school you were on some dual team state championships as well mm -hmm. Um, how would you compare the feeling of an individual title versus the team getting the natty? Well, I think uh, it's it's hard because like in high school, most of the guys really aren't aiming to be state champs. They're just kind of on the team for camaraderie. And like our team in high school was really good. We had seven guys who were ranked top ten in the nation. I'll just be cordial with it. I mean, probably six of us were top three. Mm -hmm. And then the other seven guys were just guys that wanted to be on the team and 
you know, they had a lot of fun. And, but they were tough, you know, we, we were tough. We were tough. They, they were guys that, they, they would get beat, but they wouldn't get tacked or pinned or major. They, they would make it close. They would make it fight. So, so we'd, we'd, we'd split a lot of our duel meets 7-7. Seven, seven. Mm. And then we'd win by like 15 or 20 because we'd get pins mm -hmm. in those seven matches and they'd get decisions. So that's how we would win state title. So it was like, it was different. It was, it was cool though. It was cool. It was cool. But when, when still, you're- Still tournament in Pennsylvania? Or yeah. Or individual tournament? We won both. You won both. Okay. Yeah, we gotcha. won both. Yep. Yeah, definitely individual tournament definitely favored us more yeah. than the dual tournament just because a lot of points for a champ and we had a lot of finalists, a lot of medalists. So, uh, yeah, no, I, college is definitely a lot different though because no one's really that happy with the team title unless you're a national champ, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like I know, I think Warner said it best. It was like, it's hard to be super pumped when, you know, everyone on the team hasn't really got what they wanted, you know? So that was hard for me. I mean, it was like, had I lost in the national finals, I don't even know, even if we had won the team title, because it was definitely, I think it was definitely locked up before my match. Mm -hmm. Like, had all three of us lost in the finals, like, oh my gosh. I mean, it would have been, it was still a depressed bus ride back home. Just because it's like two guys were right there, both lost in overtime. And, you know, but then I won, so they kind of brought some life back into it. But, man, we'd all been standing there like this, winning the team title, like, oh, whoop de doo you know? Right. <laughs> What's funny, you look at it back in a 91 when they won, because that was at here, Tom won, but then Terry lost to Kelber, I think. And so like, you look at the team picture, and you just kind of figure out, all right, Ryland won, Tom Brands won, Terry lost, and like, what's their demeanor in the team championship picture? And you can, you can tell, obviously. I mean, those guys, as you would expect, right? Individual sport, man. Right. When you wrestle in DeSanto, what does the upper armpit feel like when you're done? I mean, he, he's play, it, feels like he's, it feels like your armpit's just getting pinched the whole time, <laughs> seriously. And then when you, take, when you take your shirt off, it's raw. You have, like, raw all through down your armpit. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely funny. You get used to it, though, a little bit. Because, you know, he's always, RBY's wise car just kept the arm back. And this was one of the first matches where DeSanto was attacking the other leg. And, but you just got to imagine, like, man, if you're drilling with that guy, he's oh, yeah. pinching the skin. Well, he, he goes 100% only. So when you're drilling, he's just... Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, hey, hey, it's okay. Like, there's no like loose couple no, shots it's, it's, drilling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, that was gonna be a long practice. <laughs> and you were instrumental in getting him out here. Yeah, I recruited him. I, I never, I remember uh, when he uh, was off the Drexel team for whatever reason. Um, I remember he said he got like a bunch of calls and texts from a bunch of coaches, and he didn't answer anybody. But I texted him, and he answered me. And I had him out here like the next week, so that was kind of cool. Just well, like a respect thing between us. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, you probably knew him forever growing up. And when he came out... Kind of. No? Because he was, really he was a PA guy, right? He was really small, though. Got like, it. Like, when we were winning state titles and, like, Pee Wee wrestling together, he was at, like, 77 pounds. I was at 105. You've been 105 forever, right? Oh, yeah. I've been 5'3", 110, 105, 110 pounds since I was, like, 11. Man. Cause uh, yeah, eleven hundred ten. That's like more in the middle weights, upper weights, and those guys usually. Well, me and me and Warner were the same weight in junior high. <laughs> oh, wow. Cassiope was Cassiope was only two weight classes above me in sixth grade. Wow. Yeah. Well, like listen, I wrestled like Jake Woodley. I wrestled. Uh, I mean, gosh, I wish I could. My dad has a list of all the guys I wrestled in NCAA right. growing up, and most of them are bigger. Cause I was bigger growing up. Right. I was like a bigger kid. And so. then, so but was the Santa winning titles as a kid? Yeah, he he's always pretty good. Yeah. Him and Teasdale were always wrestling, though. They were always going back and oh, forth. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I knew DeSanto, just because him and Teasdale were like rivals. Right. They were both really small. And Teasdale was your guy, right? He was, yeah, he was one of my younger teammates. He's, right. Yeah. And Philly's way on the other side of the city. We're, not, we're, yeah. we're Chicago people, you know, so we don't really get that. You think PA, it's all one, but I mean, that's pretty much different part of the world. And you're talking Pittsburgh and Philly, right? Yeah, those two are definitely different parts of the world. <laughs> so he came out here. What was the, what'd you guys do in the recruiting trip? Well, I was in the dorms, so I was a freshman. So, uh, <laughs> that's <a nice> job. <laughs> and, uh, so he was staying with me in the dorms. That was, uh, he was here during the World Cup. He stayed with, oh, I remember that I was here for that. So he stayed with you in the dorms. Yeah, he slept on my futon. <laughs> Did you have a dorm roommate? Or did you have a dorm to yourself? Uh, at that time, I was by myself, but I was with more, I was, my roommate was Jacob Warner. Oh, okay. Yeah. It wasn't just some, some rando. No, we always roomed with your teammates. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So he comes Same out. Same schedules. How long after until he made the commitment? I mean, I'm pretty sure he basically said, I'm going to, like, on the visit, he's like, I'm going to come here. And his mom and dad were like, no, you're going to go to somewhere closer, you know. So they were the ones that made it hard. He's like, this is the place for me. You know, I love it here. He's like, I should have went here in the first place. I'm, 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 I literally told him that on the, on the podium. At, at PAC? Yeah, after I lost to him. I literally told him that. 
What'd you say? We were on the podium. I'm like, I'm like, why are you going to Drexel? And he was like, well, you know, I, my parents want me to go there. This basically was his answer. <laughs> you know, I go, no, you should go to Iowa. You know, Josh Jebba was his coach at Drexel. Mm-hmm. So he was an Iowa guy. I mean, he was probably all like, yeah, go to Iowa, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he knows what it's like. I mean, you think about an Iowa-style wrestler, Iowa-style, quote-unquote, whatever that is. DeSanto, to me, is like, <laughs> that. he's just an animal. Like well, that. so what they say is Iowa-style is your style. So whoever you are, like, whether it's Spencer Lee or Jacob Warner, Iowa-style is how you wrestle. Got it. They just, well, they coach to you, you know. that that That's like the Gable era is when you think of, like, that style. Mm-hmm. So that's how, that's what I think of it, at least. That's how Gable was more like, um, I'm not saying he changed their styles because I don't think that's how it worked. I mean, like, Lincoln McGrady wasn't a typical Iowa wrestler, right? right. Typical right, right. Iowa wrestler, so I don't think that's, like... Set in stone. Yeah, but definitely Austin is definitely, like, I would say he's pretty similar to, like, the Brands Brothers and how they wrestled. Kind of, like, kind of wild, in your face, high pace, a lot of emotions, you know, mm-hmm. fun to watch. Fun to watch, and you can always count on bonus points, you know, depending on who he's wrestling. You know, if he's wrestling a non-ranked dude, it's a tech. And yeah, you know he's it, killing the guy. Yeah. Killing the guy. There's no like <laughs> hanging on. Um, so, and the last thing I want to ask you about is, you won, you know, famously won NCAA, your third NCAA title last year. No ACLs, hurt the one at the Big Tens, and from then through the um, the collegiate duels in December, what was that process like for you? Were you feeling like you were ready to go, or you kind of always <laughs> didn't know it was gonna like? What was that situation? Um, I, I didn't wrestle in the mat after nationals probably till, man, maybe October, you know, and you still that, training at all or just completely break? Yeah, I was training. I mean, I, I mean, I was on the bike a lot. That's basically what my training was. It was just like therapy and bike, you know? And then when I was wrestling, I was only in the mat like for half the practice everyone else was. They would kind of they called me they put me on the old man plan you know and uh so uh, so they would warm up and then go live and then they keep going live and keep going live and then coach would step in they do extra I would do one go live and then I'd be on the bike for thirty more minutes or something so I wasn't really wrestling very much and I wasn't on the mat every day mm-hmm. some days I'd just be on the bike you know so a lot of it was just like keep my knees healthy I mean I I mean gosh I was I was struggling man. I was I was at, I had a hard time, but like I just didn't I didn't want to have surgery and no matter what. But you know when I went to wrestle with the collegiate duels, I wasn't even supposed to wrestle any of those matches. How do you keep your weight down if you're not working out like that? <laughs> Discipline. Just I eat the same things every day and I don't cheat, so you yeah. just gotta do it. That's just my life. I don't really even, at this point in my life I don't even get hungry anymore. I just eat to fuel my body. It's all more about water. Keep the water running through you. It's kind of like. So you're all year round. You're on the all year round. The there, there's no there is no off season for my weight. This is probably the heaviest I've ever been, just because I haven't done anything for 25 days. And you had I sat the in a chair. I sat in a chair, two legs straight in a brace. Right. You know, how are you supposed to lose any? Keep your weight down when your parents are feeding you three meals a day. You know, haven't seen you in forever. They want to like spoil you and right. that kind of thing. So. Whatever. It wouldn't take me long to get it down anyways. I made weight every single day during season. Every single day. What do you mean every day? Every single time I worked out, I made weight. Wow. Every single time. That's incredible. You're that close all the time. I mean, I, I mean, even if I wasn't close, I'd still make weight. Wow, Do six man. pounds of practice. That's amazing. You gotta be so, hydrated. It's called who, being efficient. When was the last time you did a full practice with no restrictions? <laughs> Gosh. I mean... So that was like kind of like uh, the thing is I was doing like full practices when I first came back with no, and I was getting hurt almost every practice. Like I wouldn't be able to finish the practice. And that was frustrating to me because even if I got hurt, I would still finish trying to finish the practice, but then your knees are hurt worse for the next time you could practice. And there's just a constant like going downhill. And that's when they were like, hey, you cannot do what everyone else is doing. Like you're, you're at this point in your career, like you're hurt. You got it, you know, so. And when I went to wrestle with the duels, um, I was like, I wasn't going to say, like, we were going to lose without me, you know, but I was like, I, I got to wrestle, so. Yeah. And now you got the surgery and, and the recovery started. Obviously, we're all can't wait to see the return. I just want to wind down with a couple questions we've sourced from some Pee Wee wrestlers. So I said <laughs> I was interviewing the great Spencer Lee. Question one, does Spencer Lee get nervous before a match? Absolutely. I get super nervous. You know, if you don't, I don't feel like if you don't get nervous, you don't care. And 
I care a lot. I, I love, I love wrestling. I love, you know, I love winning. I love putting on a show. But I definitely get really nervous. Wrestling in Carver is definitely the most nervous I, I ever get. Definitely in Carver. What I do love you? It. What it's do awesome. you? Uh, what do you do to calm, to calm it down? I mean, there's no calming your nerves. Just be ready to go. Warm up hard. As soon as the whistle blows, there's no more nerves. You're just wrestling. So. And you kind of welcome it as a sign that things are about to go down. Oh yeah, it's awesome. It is. I mean, it's just, it's really cool. A lot you of have, fans. I mean, Carver's unbelievable. Last night it was just, uh, it was just so loud. I mean, man, if we one of those close overtime matches, man, I know. you would have heard a lot louder, Carver. <laughs> when two years ago, when Kemmer took down Mark Hall, that Death was made. freaking. That was insanity. That was the moment I'm like, I can't wait till this duel comes back because. You know, the second one's never as good as the first one. Last night was pretty close, but man, it was, yeah, that was probably the loudest I've ever heard it. Mm, was awesome. Kimmer Hall. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next one from one, of our, from one of our young listeners. What do you, are you someone who visualizes, or the, the question was, what do you think before a match? So, you know, are you a visualizer, or are you kind of empty mind? Uh, probably a little bit of both. I mean, just, I don't like thinking my match through, because I'm an instinctual wrestler. I just let things fly, just do whatever, but... It's always good to think about, you know, or 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 not to, I guess. For me, it's just like just breathe, relax, make sure you're not too nervous. So, so. And then, uh, but like the day before, the, like two days before, are you like going through like, hey, the tournaments this week. I'm gonna go through each round of the tournament in my head, or like if you like. Oh, I don't do that. You don't do that. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, First match is the only match that matters. Then when you win that, you go to the next one. Perfect. Love it. So last one is what's the what's your favorite part about wrestling? That it's an individual sport. That's mono a mono. Like no one can help you in that mat. Coaches can say whatever they want, whatever they can't help you. It's you. They can't wrestle for you. So either you win or you lose, and it's based on your merit and, and you. So awesome. That's eventually. Yeah. Thanks for your time, brother. Yeah, no problem. That was fun, man. Wrestling fans, if you're going to the NCAA tournament in Detroit, Michigan, Detroit Rock City, this Thursday, I'm hosting a happy hour at Hockey Town Cafe from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time with Stalemates. So we're co-hosting this happy hour. It's in between session one and two on Thursday at Hockey Town Cafe. Be there or be square. Now let's get to the interview with Spencer Lee.